Welcome to Discover Ag, where every week we bring you the most captivating and relevant ag and food news so you can stay in the know. I'm your host, Natalie Kavoric. And I'm Tara Vanderdusen. And together, our mission is to highlight agriculture in a modern and fun way, giving you our professional farming opinions on a mix of entertainment, facts, and trending news articles. Happy Thursday, everyone. Today we have a fun but pretty full episode for you guys. We're going to dive into three industry news pieces. Um, first one, the Netherlands. If you guys are not aware of, stuff is happening again over there. Holy cow. I think this is our most requested topic of all times. Like the amount of DMs we have received saying, are you going to cover this has been amazing. Like I have loved to see it. And the next piece we're going to talk about is Whole Foods and a big move they're pulling that um, really is affecting the seafood industry right now. Yeah, there's a lot to it. This was um, something we've kind of been following this article and then more developments have come about and we thought it was time to, to really dive in. And then last but not least, our third piece is a lovely opinions article from the New York Times on the hidden cost of cheap meat. I feel like an opinion piece from the New York Times was really what, like, when we did that three-part piece, really, like, brought us together in our advocacy. So I, I'm glad we're coming back, right, to our roots of <laughs> talking about opinion pieces in the New York Times. Um, uh, but before and we then, dive in... Wait, that, and we're ending with an ag fact. And let oh, me yeah. tell you guys, like, stick around for the end, because this ag fact is a hotly debated topic. It actually made it all the way to the Supreme Court, so... Oh my gosh, Get I have no idea what ready. it is. I'm excited for the end of You're going to laugh. You, everyone's going to be like, does the Supreme Court not have something better to do? But it's a good one, so. <coughs> all right, but before we dive all into all of that, as well as our milk is the moment, we have a milk is the moment this week. Um, we want to remind you guys that every month we host a giveaway to say thank you for listening and supporting Discover Ag. So if you're tuning in today or another day or whenever it is, um, please screenshot and either share to your social channels or go leave us a review in the app. Um, either way, by doing that, you are entered to win. Um, and we do this every single month, so you can keep doing it. The more entries you do in the month, the bigger chances you'll have. So keep entering, keep sharing, um, because we appreciate you. Okay, so let's dive into our milk is the moment. I'm excited for this one because it's milk. I feel like I, you know, it's my time to shine with the milk. It's interesting, too, because it's not milk who is giving milk the moment. It's Pepsi who is giving milk the moment. I know. Um, so Pepsi and Lindsay Lohan teamed up for, if people didn't see it, it was like a sponsored post on her social pages. And also, like, Lindsay Lohan is, like, apparently back. Better than ever. I don't know. Well, that that could <laughs> be an industry news article as to debate of whether she's back or not. But um, she's re-entering the scene. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So she has like a Christmas movie out on Netflix right now. I think that's kind of why they picked her for this. So Pepsi, she what like comes downstairs or first it's Santa Claus and she leaves him milk and cookies traditional and Santa adds Pepsi to the milk. And then mm-hmm. she comes downstairs in the morning and tastes it and is like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And they're calling it Pilk. Pilk. Did I say that Pepsi right? Pepsi and milk. Yep. Pepsi and milk. Pepsi Pilk. and milk. And yeah. for anyone who watched the late 70s sitcom, um, Laverne and Shirley, you guys will already be familiar with this because that is what Laverne, that was like her favorite drink on the show. So she's been long. And it's actually people are... Our like older generation is kind of going after the younger kids being like, you guys are blown away by Pilk, but like we've known about Pilk forever. I didn't know about Pilk. I had no yeah. idea what you're talking about. I thought this was something that just is brand new, <laughs> oh, brand new gosh. information. No. Do you, you've never heard of Laverne and Shirley? <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I guess I never watched it. Oh, I don't know. I, this is all new information to me. I really thought like Lindsay Lohan came up with this with Pepsi on her own. Well, I think it's genius marketing on Pepsi's end and then it Milk just gets to benefit. But Pepsi basically saw an opportunity that they're like, how can we insert ourselves into the holiday tradition? Oh, Pilk. And then now they're trending over all social media channels. Like it's huge yeah. on TikTok right now. Um, and the comments are hilarious. Have you read through the comments of Lindsay? Yeah. The Real? They're hilarious. It's, they're it's, all, worth, it's a great comment section. They are. I they're all like it. mean girl based. They're like, it's not regular soda. It's cool soda. <laughs> like All these <laughs> stop trying to make Pilk happen. It's very funny. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. I um I should get the graphic. I have a graphic of how many gallons of milk are like put out for Santa every single year. And so, yeah, Pepsi's like amazing. That number is amazing. How do we like 
Mm -hmm. get even a fraction of that. (laughs) And now, like I said, milk's just, they're like trending in the news. They're like, thank you. Thank you, Pepsi. So anyway, you guys, we thought it'd be fun. Yeah, we thought it'd be fun to try Pilk. So Tara and I are both gonna, I got a can so that you guys can hear the sound. I drove through Um, Sonic and got a fountain drink because we know that's my favorite. Okay. Are we... Okay, I stayed on... Are you nervous? No, okay. I had a whole conversation. I had friends over last night, and they tried this the night before, oh, and I got okay. some feedback about it. And so I'm actually well. Using I Coca-Cola. imagine it's a lot. I imagine it's a lot like a um, root beer float. If you don't drink the root beer float right away, oh, oh my face. gosh, it's like spilling everywhere. <laughs> oh my! Uh, oh, it's very, very bubbly. Frothy. Yes, very yeah. frothy. Wow. Okay, three. Mine has ice in it because mine's a fountain drink. So that I don't know okay. if that'll change anything. Okay, three. Ready? Cheers. Two. One. Oh, yeah. It's not bad at all. I don't know. I, I'm like, <laughs> it's not bad, but I'm not. I don't know. I wonder if I need more Coke in mine. It's very milky. I expected it, the Coke to dominate the conversation. Yeah. yeah. Like, I would drink this. Um, I, maybe I have like the magic toned, pork on, though. I think it's like a toned down root beer float. Like, well, yeah. so I don't like root beer yeah. floats. I always have Coke floats. It's like a Coke float, but milkier yeah it's not bad yeah all right all right yeah um so that was interesting yeah I feel like that was kind of like a lot of built up for just enjoying it I I didn't think I was gonna like it (laughs) really you didn't think so I thought I'd like it more I'm kind of disappointed I thought I would like it a lot more oh hilarious well anyway Pepsi is also pushing a hashtag pilk and cookies challenge um, and they're offering cash rewards to people who post their homemade pilk while following and taking its social accounts through December 25th. So uh, if you're trying to make some big bucks, you guys, this holiday season, I don't know, maybe make a pilk video. Tara wants you to make it with Coke, though. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a Coke stan. I just... (laughs) I'm so sorry, Pepsi. (laughs) Okay, moving on. I know Natalie Yes, let's dive into this week's top three industry pieces you need to know. So first up, the Netherlands. Um, Well, the Netherlands is going to buy out and close 3,000 farms to meet climate goals. So the Dutch government is planning to buy out and close as many as 3,000 farms in the country, uh, which is obviously exacerbating an already bitter dispute with growers as leaders attempt to half the country's nitrogen emissions by 2030. Okay, where to start? They're thinking about starting this as soon as April, like in just a couple months. And yeah, they'll buy between 2,000 to 3,000 farms with a one-time payment. They are offering 120 cents like per one cent. So like a little bit more. percent price increase. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, but I, oh man, where to start? First of yeah. all, what if farmers don't want to go out and they said, then we will, it, it will break our heart, but we will seize the land. That was like mm-hmm. basically the quote. And you're like, okay. And what if there's disputes over what it's worth? Like what if some people think their land is worth more? And then I think my final thing is like, I mean, they're just going to produce meat someplace else or dairy someplace else. I would definitely think my land is worth more. <laughs> I'd be like, um, no, this is we are ten times in this, the Netherlands. Um, yeah. So, okay, you're right. Where to start? Um, going off, I guess my, one of my big points is kind of your last point, which is like we're just going to have yeah. to produce somewhere else. Um, so, for everyone who's not aware, um. The Netherlands is the world's second largest exporter of agricultural products. They are after the U.S. Um, and they provide vegetables for pretty much a majority of the Western, like Europe nation. Um, so over half of Dutch land is used for agriculture, in addition to twenty-four thousand acres worth of crops, which is obviously contributing to their greenhouse emissions. I am not denying that the Netherlands obviously has a little bit of a higher output, right? There's concern for how much they're putting out. But if you step back, when you're the world's largest, second world's largest exporter, like that, that's, to me, it's kind of like, duh, you know, like, it's like, okay, we're producing that much. You're going to have that many emissions. So to go back to what you said, which is, well, we, you know, supply and demand isn't changing and the demand for like food isn't going anywhere. 
So we're just going to have to produce that somewhere else. And so in my head, it's kind of like a math equation. It's like people being like four plus four is eight. And they're like, okay, well, we need to get four down. It's like, okay, well, we still have to feed eight. So becomes two plus six. It's like, okay, well, Netherlands is down to two now, but somewhere else is up to six. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. Like this, I mean, going back to our soapbox of like local versus global. I was about to say, this goes back to uh, Von Holder, Dr. Von Holder that we had last week. And he's like, it's not just two plus six. It's actually going to be now two plus 10 equals eight because the admissions in another country, like the Netherlands does it really well. They actually have fairly right. low admissions per pound of meat or per gallon of milk. And so if you're pushing that on a, on a developing nation that may not have the same technology, may not have access to all of the same things that these farmers have, you're actually increasing emissions, global emissions. So you're decreasing localized emissions and increasing global emissions even more. Yeah, that's a really, uh, that episode is just uh, from a couple of days ago, Tuesday. So if you guys have not listened to Dr. Holder's episode, um, you guys really need to. He is such an expert. He has so much value. If you guys want to bring facts to your advocacy on social media or wherever it is you advocate, that um, episode we did with him is jam-packed with it for the full hour. Oh, heck yeah. Even if you want to just show up with facts at your next Christmas dinner, you know, <laughs> you're going to be loaded with facts. So, I mean, obviously this, the Netherlands farmers are not standing for this. They are, there are, it's all over Twitter. There are videos everywhere of them taking to the highways again. Um, but this time I feel like there's a lot of up, there's more conflict. I feel like it's really negative. Like the police force, there's a lot of videos of them like tipping over tractors, being very forceful with people. There's a video of them kind of like shoving someone into a van. Like it is hostile over there. It's not a good environment. Yeah, I think that it's also I saw some quotes about how like they aren't listening to the wishes of their own citizens. Instead, they're listening to like globalist institutes. And I kind of agree like your citizens are not agreeing with you on this and you're like listening to global institutes instead. And it's just interesting how that'll play out like in politics like these people you need these people to vote for you and be supportive of you so I just am like what is happening over there it also really worries me about what who's going to follow suit like what is going to happen in other countries now after this happens so I was literally just going to say that there's a lot of narrative out there that other nations um I mean we feel like we're removed from it right like oh it's across the pond or it's like Netherlands issue but we should be really vigilant against um, you know, <laughs> things like this being taken up out, like, I guess, per speaking personally in, you know, in America, but for everyone else in it, their nations, they need to be aware of like what could potentially be coming from their government when it comes to agriculture too. Like, it's a very scary. This quote or this fact, like, was alarming. Um, some farms, in order to like fulfill their goals, some farms may have to reduce their emissions by as much as 95%. How... Like, how do you expect farmers to do that and still produce food? And then up to 30% of all livestock farms may need to be shut down for good. I just... Well, and going back to what you just said about how can we expect people to... Like, how can you do that to farmers and expect them to still produce food? Um, there was this quote in there that it was like, it is difficult to overstate the recklessness of undermining farmers during the greatest global food crisis in decades. This will likely exacerbate the food price inflation we're already experiencing. Um and then they went on to talk a little bit about like the productivity and yields and how that like the demand may go down there, but it's going to be taken up somewhere else. So it's just it's wild to me, honestly. Yeah. The last thing I want to mention is the economic toll. Um, nobody like this. was It was one of the last sentences in this article, which really frustrated me that um, farming groups estimate that farming accounts for 54,000 businesses throughout the country and produces 94.5 billion euros in exports. Like, where are you going to also like make that money up or have new employment? Like you're talking about taking a massive swath of your employment, your economic exports. Like, where are you going to get that from? I mean, I would love to just be a fly on the wall. Like what, like, are they talking about that in these meetings? You know what I'm saying? Like, are people bringing up these, all these points and they have like, answers to them or like, I just, I'm, I just, I'm like, what is the conversation? The other thing I wanted to highlight, I guess my last point is that there's this political party called, um, well, it's the BBB. I don't Boer burger booing or something. It's a farmer citizen movement that has basically come out of this. Um, and they're ranking fourth in the polls and their big, their primary goal of the party will be, um, to reform the nitrogen law. And they're like, 
positioning themselves as a voice for the needy. So I thought it was really interesting that there's actually like political party being made out of this. Um, I mean, it makes sense because it's obviously yeah. like Netherlands. It's very, I don't, I don't know the right words. Like it's a dire situation for them. Someone needs to be doing something about it. But I just thought that was crazy that there's already a political party coming out of it and they're ranking really high. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, okay. Uh, yep. Next moving on one. to the also, second news piece. Before we move on, I'm just like, I have a lot of drinks here. I have a Coke, a Pilk, a water. I like every time I take a drink when I have a minute, I'm like, which one am I going to get now? Like it's like Russian roulette of drinks over here. Mm-hmm. So, All right. Whole okay. foods to stop buying Maine lobster until sustainability status addressed. So I actually sent this, not this article, that Whole Foods article to Tara, but a different one. I don't know, like maybe three weeks back that talked about how Maine lobster lost its sustainable label as a, two seafood guides, one really big one, um, kind of warned against it. Um, and we never ended up covering it because like we've told you guys before, um, there's obviously a lot of things going on in the news. We pick our favorite. The other pieces we end up sharing to social media. So if you guys aren't following our discover ag underscore page, go over there and watch our stories because every single day a week we do highlight a new piece that we're not bringing on to the podcast. Um, but I thought it was really fascinating and we decided to cover it this week because this new article about whole foods just came out about how they saw the labeling, how it was removed and they're not going to, um, sell anymore. So the whole thing is about, um, lobster, like fisheries posing a risk to right whales, North Atlantic Mm -hmm. right whales, that the bycatch management is not, effective, which by catches where they catch things they don't mean to in their nets. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they were on the yellow list and they moved to the red list and Whole Foods will not sell anyone who is on the red list. Mm-hmm. But Whole Foods is going to continue selling the lobster that they already caught and ordered and bought, but they won't continue buying Maine lobster. So the I'm looking, oh, there's my phone. I'm like, I'm looking for my phone. The the retailer, um, or I guess the labeling, I don't think re- the organization, that's probably the right word that, um, revoked their status and changed it is called the M at M S C it's the Marine Stewardship Council. Um, and it is one of the, I don't know, I guess organizations that kind of sets the standards for the fishing industry. And so I actually reached out to, um, a gal in Alaska that is, I don't know her exact role. I think they own a boat that goes out, but she's really big into seafood and she shares online. Um, yeah, I follow her too. If it's the same girl. Yep. And so I just asked her kind of about MSC and what she knew. Cause I just kind of wanted to get, obviously Tara and I are not very familiar <laughs> with, um, at least we are I not am fishermen. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> um, And she said there's a lot of controversy around MSC. She said a big part due to Seaspiracy. So I don't know, Tara, do you remember them mentioning anything about that in Seaspiracy? I know you've seen that. Yeah. And I talked to some fishermen after like following watching it and they had a lot to say about, you know, just the misrepresentation of the fishing industry in that video and by, you know, organizations that are supposed to be like, neutral, I guess, to everything and being like, just giving misinformation. So anyway, she said, overall, MSC is a good place to start when sourcing seafood uh, from the consumer standpoint. I think it's a great tool in the first level of sustainable seafood buying that's easier for people to understand. Um, But she said on the industry side, it's just a marketing tool and a very expensive one. Alaska Salmon actually opted out of the MSC certification years ago because producers felt people already understood the level of sustainability. And so she kind of goes on to talk about this idea, which you and I have talked before, about like labeling and how much it dictates what it's actually doing. Um, And so I don't know. I just find this so really, I don't know. I So I found this kind of interesting that an independent auditor, M-R-A-G, I don't know what that stands for. I can't find it. But they found that Maine's lobster fishery is unlikely to cause harm to right whales, mainly because of the very limited overlap between rope in Maine fishery and right whales habitat. Mm -hmm. So this is not just like a, I think it's like worth noting, like, that while one organization says that they're now in the red, others are saying they're doing a good job. So it's just not that straightforward. And obviously all of the 
licensed lobster men are really upset about because they're aligning kind of with that, you know, obviously saying that they, cause this is actually the second time they've been revoked. It sounds like a while, like it sounds like you get your MSC for five years and then you have to be like reauthorized. Um, and so they're saying we have done everything to comply with conservation law and we've taken plenty of measures to reduce the risk of ensnaring right whales. And again, like you said, evidence is scant that lobstering is driving the endangered, endangered whales number down. And so sometimes you have to wonder, again, we're not experts. These are all just opinions, but it's like, are we just looking for a reason of why the whale number is going down and pinpointing on this? Or is there actual like cause and effect, you know, because th- I mean, whole, there are people are going to be following whole Foods suit. So if whole foods is going to be stepping out of sourcing from them, I mean, I'm sure other people are going to follow suit. And so it's just like, well, there goes their, you know, income and livelihood. Yeah. I think one of the hard things when you have to like renew something every five years is I, I'll relate it to dairy, like our environmental standards. I remember like for a while, every five years, it was like they added some new regulation or they'd be like, oh, never mind. That thing you did five years ago is not relevant anymore. You've got to oh, do this. And like, I understand like things develop and change, but like asking farmers, fisheries, whatever it is to change their practices every single five years to meet whatever like new thing we think is right or wrong um, is really difficult. Cause like for dairy, for example, one year they said, this is what you have to do. And then five years later, they were like, we made a mistake and that's actually not the best way to do it. So now we need you to redo it. And it was like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, a mistake, like, and farmers had already installed that technology. And so similarly, like it just, you can't just change regulations on farmers on a whim. It needs to be like sound science. And so I I'm, would be really curious if they're like upping their standards every year or if something is changing where they like were compliant five years ago and now aren't. That is crazy to think about, like you said, because um, obviously we're progressing and discovering new things. I mean, so no fault to them, right? Like, OK, right. we're recommending this now, uh, but five years, you know, now we need to change. But like you said, some of the people might have just finally got the funds to make the change like a year before or two years before. Like, oh, what a mess. Um, anyone listening, if you are involved, you know, in this industry and have anything to share, please DM us on our Discover Ag underscore Instagram page because we also do love to bring you guys into the conversation and bring your p- opinions and expertise. So we'll likely screenshot and share a story so that other can people can see, you know, what you have to add to this conversation. So if anyone has anything to add, please head over there and do that now. All right, on to our third news piece you need to know this week, the opinion article from the New York Times that's titled The Hidden Cost of Cheap Meat. So animal rights activist Leah Garcia, I don't know, something French, discussed how, or I don't know, I guess maybe it's not, the E with the thing over it is French, right? I think that's French, discusses (laughs) how modern meat production harms animals, people, and the environment. Um, And BTW, she is the chief executive for Mercy for Animals, so... Oh, that going for us. Big shocker. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I so this is the New York Times article I sent you was actually like a piece of a podcast where she was interviewed on the Ezra Keen show. Um, and so I listened to the podcast and let me tell you, it was a doozy. I think if I didn't know anything about animal ag and I listened to it, I'd be like, I'm never eating meat again. Like Seriously. it was terrible. So that's my first thing I wrote down is I just I have such a problem when pieces are fear laced and all they do is just make people fearful of their food. I, I, cause I actually, I sent you a podcast on my way home the other night that I was like, Hey, listen to this. I, this podcast is kind of, it's, I don't think it was supposed to be pro or con like not anti or pro meat or the industry. Mm -hmm. I think it was actually supposed to be maybe a little bit pro, but it was so fear laced. I was like, again, putting myself in anyone's shoes that doesn't ranch, I'd be like, well, I guess I just won't eat meat because I'm a little confused and a little scared. And I just have such a problem with people putting out these, like whether your intentions are good to educate people about some things, when you wrap it up in the fear bow, I have a huge problem with it. I completely agree. I don't even, I'm not sure. Like, I don't want to go like point by point on this, but some of like, I I wrote out point by point. (laughs) Me too. But I, you saw my notes from the podcast. The podcast was an hour and 20 minutes. So I have a lot of notes on it. But one thing is like, just as an example, she kept talking about how, um, meat consumption as its highest level ever, like that we're consuming the most amount of meat not like per person. That's not what she was meaning. Just like overall. And it's like, well, no kidding. We just passed 8 billion people. Mm -hmm. We have more people than we've ever had. So obviously meat 
we're going to need more food, whether that's vegetables or animals, to feed them. Like, mm-hmm. it was just a dumb – it was just, like, a fear-mongering thing that didn't actually have a point that really frustrated me. Well, the written article – I mean, the written article started out that meat is costs more than 50 years ago. And I was like, is that new? Like, that's not supposed to be? Like, everything else in the world is more than it was 50 years ago. Or, uh, sorry, meat is more affordable. And I was like, is it – like, we have advanced so much. Like, is yeah. it – where like why would it why would we be paying high I don't know um I, go, maybe that, we should highlight like positive instead of like counter stating her negative things because I, I have a couple like positive facts we could share about Agatha so that was I feel like so one of the things that I like the price that was the, this the whole thing was mm-hmm. about the hidden cost of meat you know and so she was like it's cheaper than it's ever been First thing, I do think that's a very elitist way of thinking because if you want to make it more expensive, that means that there will be people who cannot afford it. So I was frustrated with that. Then the other thing, her point was that farmers should get paid more. Like we should actually be paying for what it costs. And while that I support, I was like, I agree. I do think there's a lot of instances where farmers don't get paid what their product is actually worth. Funny, fun fact, farmers (laughs) don't pick our prices. Like we don't get to go and say, this is what our milk is worth today. So I'm like, can you, like her whole thing was yelling at farmers. And so I was like, but what are we, we don't, we're price takers, not price makers. So we can't control, like, I would love to be able to say, you know what, actually our milk costs $20 to produce a hundred pounds of milk that I don't get that choice right now. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. So while I agreed with her on the point, I was like, you clearly don't fully understand the pricing system. So moving into some of the other things she said beyond pricing, one was she talked about the percentage. Again, everyone loves to talk about greenhouse gas emissions, Um, which (laughs) if you listen to any of our podcasts, it's not that Tara and I don't care about that or care about like carbon sequestration in that conversation. But we're starting to like hopefully drive more conversation around like other things that accompany this that we should be talking about instead of just like having carbon tunnel vision. Um, So if you notice, she said... I kind of wanted to applaud her a little bit because she did use the right instead of like, uh, you know, blowing up the percentage. She did use 14.5% is what is, she said, you know, for, I don't remember the exact how it was worded, which is the global statistic. Global. And she did not That's say global globally, statistics. but I did give her credit for not like using the other false percentages that were out there. I was like, oh, thank you. Because there's yeah. ones that are like saying 28, 40, like really high and she did allude yeah. to like as high as 28 but she at least did she was say a as little high bit as 28 mm-hmm. at least she was a little bit rooted in some truth but she left out globally and it makes it so sound like that again, was US. one of my my struggles with her is she kept switching between us and global when she felt like it was suited her benefit she yeah. also kept sw- and she kept switching between species when it benefited her. Like she oh, would be talking about I chickens know. and then the next comment would be about hogs and the next comment would be about meat. And even I was like, wait, that doesn't. And then I was like, oh, she's just switching which species she's talking about and making it sound like this is this like horrendous mm-hmm. situation. And I was like, you're talking about cattle, but two seconds ago, you were talking about chickens. And those are not the same things. Yeah. So the podcast I sent you did the same thing. They were trying to talk about like big meat monopolization in the packer industry, but they were switching between beef pork and chicken so much and I was like like at the like it made no sense if you know anything about the different sectors of like beef pork and chicken and but they were lumping it into one protein sector and I was like that's not like we can't have that conversation as the same it's not it's not the same yeah um Um, what 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 else did you have positive gosh you what you must have really been in the right mood to see this as positive no i I just so i pulled out a couple things the epa which like to correct what i mean if i was to go on and go like tit for tat um i would say that like according to the epa you know beef cattle represent 2.3 percent of u.s gas greenhouse gas emissions um and then i would talk about you know, we so there are facts out there that show since 1990, the U.S. emissions have increased by 12 percent. But that is a very small increase when you compare it to the productivity gain. So the U.S. we're producing kind of like what you said, we're producing 43 percent more food um, and agricultural products than we were historically because we have to keep up with the millions more mouths we have to feed. Um, and we're doing that with 50 million, you know, million fewer beef cattle in the U.S. So like sustainability, I just want to tell people like, again, U.S. is leading in sustainability and to offset, like we've said this over and over again, and I think we actually talked about this with Dr. Holder on Tuesday, but like to ask, com- you know, countries that are leading in sustainability to decrease their output makes no sense. Like we are like, like we have it down, you know, like <laughs> don't get in yeah, our way. We got like it down. We're, 
yeah, like we know what we're doing and we're working on like bettering it. So to take away like from a well-oiled machine and then like try and start up, you know, like a old clunker, like literally makes no sense. Like we cannot have countries that are sustainable decreasing their productivity. Well, on the sustainability side, one of the things that really frustrated me about it was she complained about too much emissions and that uh, we're using too much land. And then literally in the next breath was like factory farming, factory farming, which uses less land, has smaller emissions. So I was it was just very contradicting She what she mm-hmm. was saying and what like it was, every other sentence kind of contradicted what her actual thing was. And then she was talking about how much land we use, but didn't mention the fact that a lot of cattle are on, you know, land that's not suitable as we always talk about for crop production. So that was frustrating. And then I think actually what irked me the most is we have interviewed a lot of experts on this podcast and like talked with them in real life. We have heard from so many experts that will say, I'm sorry, I can't speak to that. Actually, that's not my like area of expertise. This woman was speaking to it all. She was talking about <laughs> genetics and cattle, well, uh, you know, <laughs> new emissions. Like, I mean, she was all over the board. And I was like, are you an expert in every single thing you talk about? Like, well, and the I problem is people will be like, well, it's opinion, right? It's an opinion article. But the problem is yeah, people don't leave that taking that into consideration. They're like, oh, that was an interesting opinion. They're like, oh, wow, those facts are terrifying. And that's my problem with opinion articles. It's like people take them. It's like the same thing as docuseries or documentaries. It's like people take them as like there are governing bodies that are regulating the information. Or like you said, that this lady is an expert in this area. She set foot on ranches, you know, familiar with all the different livestock industries, She's not. It's an opinion. She has no idea. This is just her opinion. But people are it's going to spread like rapid wire fire that it's like fact and, you know, yeah. change yeah. people's buying habits. Um, One other thing that I found was interesting. She talked a lot about genetics. Genetics in our animals has never been better. I would I imagine. I mean, your family's big into genetics. Mm-hmm. Our, genetics for cattle has never been healthier, never been better. And she was like, our cattle like aren't even don't look like what they used to like 50 years ago is one of her big things. I don't know if anyone's seen what a banana looked like before (laughs) we started like genetically, you know, not genetically modifying it, but just genetically breeding it. So we produce bigger bananas. You could say that for every single vegetable too. tomatoes are bigger than they've ever been Uh, like that's what we do as humans is we find a trait we like and we crossbreed it and make better more food. Well, like, like you so said, genetics frustrated. is one of the reasons why we're more sustainable. Like it has I increased know. our yeah. efficiency so much. Um, I think the last thing I'll end on, which is like something that you and I are really passionate about and like bringing into more conversations is the dietary and health portion of this. So people who are pushing, like, again, let's say uh, someone listened to this lady's podcast or read the article, didn't know much about the industry, decided to take her word as fact, as an expert opinion. And it's like, well, I just, you know, I'm a little nervous about buying meat. I'm not going to do it anymore. It's like, like you do not receive like listen adequate people. nutrition yes you do not receive enough nutrition from foods if you do not have animal dried foods in your diet like b12 um and what's the other one dha i think are the only things you can get from animal source proteins iron is the leading deficiency in like and we're not talking about you know i think people think of like malnutrition in third world countries iron deficiency is the number one leading thing in the us um yeah. like we we are a malnourished. I think a lot of people think of malnourishment as, you know, underweight, uh huh. but it's like overweight, uh, diabetes. Like those are all like, that's a malnourishment disease. Like we have a problem with health and taking out animal proteins is not going to be good for it. Yeah. I, I think that I'm trying to think what my last statement is. And I think I might lean into, um, if you guys, big sky Caroline, I feel like we always talk about her, but she recently did a reel about how vegetables are more mass produced than people realize. Like people think it's just, factory farming is just an animal ag. When in reality, like you could go to a vegetable farm and be like, Oh wow, it's pretty like factoryized too, or whatever. I like that word factoryized. Um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's the best I could come up with. But I just don't, I think people think of, I think everyone wants this like holistic idea of like you have chickens in your backyard and you have some hogs and you have vegetables and it's like, that's what they're envisioning. It should be like the opposite of factory farming. And it's like, unless every single person or the majority of us want to have that in our backyard, that is not possible. Mm -hmm. So whether you are buying vegetables or you are buying animal proteins, 
it is more industrialized like that. We have less farmers that have to feed more people. Well, and going back to sustainability, if you want us to be the most sustainability with the piece of land we have, like it's going to be, what'd you say? Factoryized. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad that's a word We're now. We're make it trending. <laughs> no, you guys do not make that trending. <laughs> no. Oh, oh, so anyway, I don't know. There's a lot more to it. I think we could go on for days, but I think yeah. that kind of wraps me up for what I want to share. Yeah, let's move into our hard hitting, I don't know, wowing act fact you have for Ooh, us. You guys, this one is hard hitting. Okay, if you had to guess what is the most popular vegetable by tons in the world, what would it be? Well, I know because you told me what this ag fact had to oh, do Oh, shoot. With. I forgot. Yeah. I told you. But I'm okay. glad you told me because I should have just lied and been like, mm, tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You would have been like, like for yes. levels. Yeah. So, so I was looking for a fun ag fact. And so I stumbled across that, that um, 17% of all vegetables produced are tomatoes. And the next one that comes in is onions at only 9%. So, it, Ooh, I mean, that's like a massive a difference. Mm-hmm. And so I was telling my mom about this and she was like, but tomatoes are fruit. And I was like, oh, well, then what the heck? This is crap. Like, I don't like this ag fact. So then I started doing research. And in in 1883, the Supreme Court ruled that tomatoes are vegetables, not fruit, even though technically they are fruit because they have seeds. Mm -hmm. They are ruled vegetables because of our culinary taste lump tomatoes with vegetables. That was in 1883. That's what the Supreme Court was doing in 1883, (laughs) deciding whether tomatoes were vegetables or fruit. I don't know why it mattered. Like, I never really got to the bottom of the Supreme Court case of, like, why this was so important Mm -hmm. to anyone. But um, what else is going on in 1883? You would think something important. 1883 news history. Well, isn't that? um, That's the show. That's Yellowstone. Oh, yeah. So it's like post-Civil War. Yeah. (laughs) Post-Civil War. Um, so I don't know, maybe there was a real lull going on at that yeah. point in time, but I found that fascinating. So, but even if tomatoes weren't, that's kind of crazy that they also thinking about it, that tomatoes don't weigh a ton, like compared to an onion. And so it was by mass. So that's a ton of tomatoes. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting. The like depending on where you're at, like if you're in India, the average person has four medium sized tomatoes per week. In the United States, we have 12 medium sized tomatoes per week. So I miss really that getting our tomatoes back because I'm reading on October 15th, the Supreme Court of the United States declares part of the Civil Rights Act of 1870 of this case. Oh, yeah, of 1875 to be unconstitutional since the court allows private individuals and corporations to discriminate based on race. So uh, our courts were busy with civil rights issues and tomato issues in 1883. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I found it fascinating. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's my ag fact for today. I hope you found it as interesting as me. I love it. If you All guys right. have some good ad facts, like, I would love to hear from some people. What do you guys have? What do you guys know about ag? Send it our way and we'll share. Mm-hmm. Hit us up on the Instagram page. All right. Well, thanks for listening to Discover Ag, where once a week we cover the top three industry news pieces that you guys need to know in the world of ag. We keep our fingers on the pulse so you guys don't have to. And don't forget, once a month, we send someone who either left us a review or shared our podcast to their social channels a thank you gift for listening. So if you're enjoying the podcast, be sure to share and tag us and send us to a friend. And if you guys want more of us during the week, you can follow us on our personal pages, Natalie Kovork and Tara Vanderdusen. And as always, we'd love to see you guys over on the Discover Ag underscore page. See you next week.